Hello, I'm Hannah Sachs, executive editor of NEJM Evidence, and this is Stat Stat. Ah, fall. There's a chill in the air, and your thoughts turn from Fourth of July fireworks and long summer nights to apple cider and Halloween. You're excited to get in the spirit and carve a pumpkin for your porch. But when should you do it? Too soon, and it'll be a mushy mess by Halloween. Too late, and you'll have missed the chance to enjoy it longer. You decide to spend this fall doing a study of all the jack-o'-lanterns in your neighborhood. Every time a new one appears on a porch, you'll add it to your list. Every three days, you'll make the rounds of the neighborhood to track how long each pumpkin survives. On November 1st, you'll look at your data and know how long you can expect to keep your pumpkin out next year. The problem you face Trying to figure out when a jack-o'-lantern is likely to turn to mush is similar to a very common challenge in clinical trials, where it's referred to as survival analysis. Survival analysis is concerned with finding the time to occurrence of a given event, such as death, cancer relapse, or hospitalization. The outcome for survival analysis has two components, whether the event occurred and the time at which it occurred. Sometimes the exact timing of the event of interest is clear. If during one of your morning jack-o'-lantern inspections you see a pumpkin fall down the steps and go splat, you can mark down the exact moment of that pumpkin's demise. But in clinical trials, and pumpkin inspecting, actually witnessing the moment the outcome occurs may be rare. Typically, you don't observe a participant experiencing the event of interest. You can only determine that it has or has not happened sometime between periodic check-ins. Moreover, while all pumpkins will eventually turn to mush, some of them may not have done so by the time the study ends. Some may even be mushy at the start of your study. Censoring is how you deal with this ambiguity in the time of an event's occurrence. Depending on whether and when the event occurred, data can be left censored, interval censored, or right censored. Let's talk about each. Data are left censored when the event occurs before your first observation. However, individuals who have already experienced the event of interest before a trial begins would usually be selected out at the start, based on the trial's inclusion and exclusion criteria, so left censoring is not so common. Data may also be interval censored. This occurs when you know that the event occurred sometime between two observation points, but you don't know exactly when. For example, you're only checking on the neighborhood pumpkins twice a week. So if you see one that's mushy one morning that was fine three days before, you don't know exactly how long it lasted between those time points. But you do know that no event had occurred by your previous check-in. So the true pumpkin survival time is greater than the last check-in, but less than or equal to the current check-in, yielding an interval, which includes the true but unknown survival time. Data are right censored for participants who didn't experience the event at all by the end of the study period. Up until the point of right censoring, the study end time, They were at risk for the event of interest, but did not experience it. Their observed survival time goes from the moment they entered the study until the study's end. Their actual, longer survival time is censored. It's not observed. Now that you understand these types of censoring, let's look more closely at survival analysis. Consider a set of survival times. A list of participants, here pumpkins, and the sequence of observations in which they were event-free. That is, not mush. The probability of surviving to a given observation time can be calculated by multiplying the probabilities of surviving in each of the intervals leading up to the given interval times the probability of surviving in that interval. The individual probabilities for each interval are given by 1 minus the number of events in the interval divided by the number of participants surviving to the start of that interval. This series of products is the basis of the Kaplan-Meier approach, and it yields a cumulative survival probability, or survival function. When plotted, it's often referred to as a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. Because it is assumed that the survival probability is constant between observations of events, this curve has a stair-step appearance. From this curve, it's possible to determine, for example, the time at which the probability of survival has dropped to 50%, known as the median survival time. Beneath these graphs, investigators report the number of participants who are still at risk for the outcome. With all this in mind, you're ready to start your pumpkin survival study. You plan to use the median survival time to choose when to put out your jack-o'-lantern next year. Of course, a Kaplan-Meier curve is just the start of survival analysis. Maybe you'll want to be able to compare curves. Given two curves, maybe one for pumpkins with candles and one for those without, 
can you tell if candles change survival times in a meaningful way? We'll get into those comparisons another time. For now, get out there, enjoy the cool air, and start counting pumpkins. <laughs>